Andrea, are you able to start oh. rolling? Sorry, uh, my internet skipped. Sorry, good evening. Andrea McCauley, um, Superintendent of Education for Inclusive Student Services and Grove Schools. Christine Thatcher, a trustee for the town of Whitby. Donna Edwards, for trustee for the town of Ajax. Russ Davidson, Vice Principal Ajax High School. Tara Kelly, Durham Down Syndrome Association. Quincy James, Principal West Creek Public School. Claudine Burrell, Autism Ontario, Durham Region. Craig Cameron, member at large. Hannah Nguyen, Easter Seals, Ontario. Imran Syed, Principal Sir John A. McDonald. Eva Kiriakides, Association for Bright Children and SEAC Chair. Is there anybody else? Uh, yep, there's me, Elizabeth Daniel, Ontario Association for Families of Children with Communication Disorders. Is that all for roll call? Rowan Jarvis, Learning Disability Association, Durham Region. Thanks, Tara. Kyla McKee, Special Education Officer. Lisa Drake, Chief of Speech, Language and Hearing Services with the Durham District School Board. Carolyn Escher, Chief of Social Work and Attendance Services at the Durham District School Board. Steve Raffi, Chief of Psychological Services at the DDSB. Okay, at this time, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, that the Durham District School Board acknowledges that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships, both historic and modern, with the territories upon which our school board and schools are located. Today, this area is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that the Durham region forms a part of the traditional and treaty territories of the Mississauga of Scugard Island for Na First Nations, the Mississauga peoples, and the treaty territory of the Chippewas of Georgina Island, First Nation. It is on these ancestral and treaty lands that we teach, learn, and live. As far as regrets go, we have regrets today from Kathy Keedy. Um, it, it, we need to uh, approve the agenda. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Eva, it's Christine Thatcher here. I just had a question when I, I wasn't in attendance at the last meeting. Unfortunately, I had a conflict with an SCC meeting at a school. But when I was reading it over, on page nine under direct services, uh, maybe uh, Steve Graffy can tell us. It says brief therapy. And I wasn't sure if that was really brief therapy because to me it kind of should have been grief therapy. I just wondered uh, if uh, which of those would be correct. Hi, um, I, I think we're at, you're looking at the approval of the minutes. Yes, I'm looking at the minutes from last day under direct right. services. Yeah, so we just need to, Here's we just yeah. need the agenda first. I we just need a motion to oh, I'm sorry. the agenda first. I'll, I'll You're at the agenda, the I'm at the minutes. Yes, okay. Thank you, Steve. Okay, I'll motion to move the agenda. Thank you, Donna. Second. Second. All in favor? You can just raise your hand, I think. And so oh, actually, we might have some people not on, but if you can raise your hand, that'd be great.
Okay, so moving on to the approval of the minutes. So on page nine, you had a correction from brief therapy to grief therapy. Uh, as I said, uh, Eva, I'm not sure if it is a correction, but it uh, under direct services on page nine, it said that brief therapy. And uh, I wondered if that was correct, because to me, I kind of thought it should be grief therapy. But um, maybe Steve could, uh, Drafty could clear that up for us. Sure. Um, I, I don't see your minutes in front of me, but I presume that you might be talking about uh, direct service delivery to students. Um, yes. And we're talking about uh, level of services uh, for the secondary uh, panel. Um, we have psychological services, we have social work services. It would be brief therapy in the sense that uh, a certain number of sessions, I think if I'm um, thinking correctly, if it's uh, one to three, four to six, that still falls within the domain of what's defined as brief therapy. Um, I guess in the therapy world, it's not a, I guess I do know, in the therapy world, therapy runs a lot longer than you know three to six sessions. So. Um, so in our definition of therapy, that is so, still considered to be an abbreviated form. So it should be brief for the B. Thank you very much. Not to say we don't do grief therapy <laughs> somewhere, sometimes they're in, but definitely uh, it's, it's a brief form. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Eva, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, I thought I was holding it down. Um, does anybody else have any questions with respect to the minutes from the uh, agenda or from the minutes of the February 20th? If there's no uh, questions with respect to that, can we get a motion to approve the minutes? All motion, Tara. Tara, thanks. Uh, seconder? Hi, Tara, it's Claudine. I'll second. Thank you. Um, all, I see some people don't have uh, their picture up, so I can't uh, see if their hand is raised. So maybe uh, you can click the uh, yes or no button to approve minutes from, from last month. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, the the next item on our agenda is the re approval of the meetings dates for the 2021 calendar year. Uh, has everybody had a chance to look at the printout of the calendar? You keep on cutting out there, Eva. Oh, sorry, we're looking at the... Um, the minute or the calendar dates for the 2021 school year. Um, has everybody had a chance to take a look at that calendar? So I'm, I'm suggesting that we go through it um, month by month and just confirm that you're good with the date by hitting the yes button. Um, which can be found if anybody missed it under participants, um, it will, it'll put a panel up on your side. The September meeting would be September 17th. Okay, se seven yeses for that. Um, the October date is the 15th. Is everybody good with that? 
I just have a question um, because I think it's October is when we have the volunteer distinctions, whether we're going to have that or not, and what date has been reserved. Donna, we can check that with Kim. Um, I'm not sure one has been reserved at this time um, through Heather and Vic, uh, but we can check on that. Um, and if it is a conflict, we'll bring back an amendment to SEAC. All okay, right, that sounds, okay, that sounds good. November would be November 19th. December would be December 17th. I think the biggest consideration there would be uh, school concerts, but I don't don't know that there's a better date to move it to. Suggestions? Most people um, the last time had said that most of their concerts was happening the week before. Um, again, we don't know what the situation is going to be. So again, if we have to move it, we can check closer to the time and make, and make an amendment, but I think the 17th should be fine. Okay, that, sound, that sounds good to me. Um, moving on to January, uh, January 20. Um, just uh, again, the 21st is usually, um, the third week of January is usually the public education symposium. Um, so it's a possibility, depending on who's going to that, that you might not have a trustee representative, but hopefully we'll, we'll get one there just, uh, just so you know. Okay, and uh, again, if it's something we have to look, revise and we can go back and look at that, I think right now we just don't know what dates, what, what things are happening. So what will go ahead and what won't. February is uh, February 18th. March would be March 25th. April would be April 15th. May would be May 20th. And June would be June 17th. Okay, so it looks like those uh, dates work for everybody for next year, at least for now. Um, we can move on then to the inclusive student services report. Thanks, Eva, and thank you to SEAC um, for your ongoing support. We have a number of members of our leadership team uh, who are joining us for SEAC this evening. And on the agenda, we've kind of chunked the information into um, four quadrants, um, bringing you updates that we think are important um, to your organizations and to the families and students um, that you help support as well. Um, and so what we're gonna do is chunk into those four quarters. Uh, we'll share a little bit of what we've been doing um, to support um, students um, and families um, and provide opportunity for you to give us some feedback um, or inquiry to that um, and then move to the next section. Um, Diane, thank you for that. Uh, we'll loop back after the presentations if that's okay. 
Um, so this is, um, as, as we're all aware, uh, living it uh, personally and uh, through the volunteer roles and um, staff roles that we have, uh, a very unique time um, in terms of locally landing um, that global uh, situation of a global pandemic and how that sits for our families. Um, for us as a board, the announcement that schools were closing came on that Thursday night, uh, with us being one of a few boards provincially that uh, had a board designated holiday on the Friday. And so our students and our staff were not in our buildings for that day to close off prior to March break. Um, and that has been embedded in planning through March break and over the last few weeks, knowing that staff and students um, did not have that last chance as many of the bells had had already rung and students were on their way to March break for that. Um, I would like to share um, deep pride in the team, both um, within inclusive student services and systemically. Um, education ha has shifted over the past few years and decades, um, but not at the rate um, that we, that's been immobilized. Um, in the last three to four weeks. And that's inclusive of those of us that um, provide services to elementary and secondary students, those that provide preschool services, um, and then a nod to our secondary partners as they move um, post-secondary programs as well. That collaboration across departments, um, as we saw the commitment to our kids with special education strengths and needs be really infused into the work of the board, um, has really truly come to light with every decision around the senior team um, and planning table. Um, that um, accommodations for students and families, the recognition of individual circumstance has been absolutely infused within that. Um, the ingenuity and creativity of our teams as they pivot, um, not only education to distance learning, um, but to their service model um, has been absolutely impressive. Uh, the feedback we continue to receive um, and want our families reaching out to us, the key foundation to this time period and how we truly serve families and students from e-learning and uh, online learning, distance learning is very specific and streamed to this time. Carolyn's gonna share a little bit um, just before that around a tool, because we found that there was an overwhelming amount of information for families and youth, many of whom are navigating this for themselves. And so the teams have put together kind of a consolidated resource um, that we hope is useful to your organizations as well. Um, and then Steve's just going to talk a little bit about how we're pivoting um, our service model to go beyond the um, telephone connects with our kids um, and into that uh, virtual service model. So I'm just going to share my screen for a second um, and share with you um, sorry, document. Um, so this document is in your inboxes, um, so you don't need to read it this evening. Um, but it's our outward commitment as a board to the role that everyone has within a distance learning uh, model of supporting our kids and families. And I'm just going to take you to the center of the document for a minute. Um, and there you see our commitment um, to the accommodation needs for our students. Again, um, academics sitting behind the well-being needs of our students. Um, as we know, we can play a pivotal partner role in things like food continuity and housing continuity um, and a foundation of safety. So a lot of the work over the last few weeks has been to pivot our, our supports, not only to foster engagement through distance learning, but also to put in additional layers um, and tweak our systems to the new form, to this current context in terms of risk and safety supports for our students. So we've amended um, protocols such as our suicide intervention protocol um, and what that looks like, our trauma and crisis protocol um, and what that looks like and sounds like when we are not able to open welcoming centers, which is one of the things that we usually do if there's been a crisis or loss in a school community. And so our teams have been very intentional in that layered into distance learning, um, some education pieces for our teachers around the duty to report as we know that families are under high stress at this time um, and looking at that. So when you get a chance to go through this document, um, again, starting on page eight, uh, you see the roles that fall under inclusive student services, starting with those team members that are based in our schools. So our educational assistants, our interpreters and interveners, which Lisa will highlight um, how they're supporting students and our special education program teachers being critical in the delivery of programming 
and really looking at what those alternate programs and modifications look like for our learners uh, when they're not present in a classroom or together. From there, um, we include our certs um, as leaders of inclusive programming and then our team centrally, um, hearing resource, psych, and you see the um, core commitments of each of the teams outlined in this document. Um, I'll just note that you see our audiologists listed. You will also see our orientation um, and mobility specialists. These are two individuals on contract with the board and their services have been continued during this time. Um, for instance, our mobility and orientation um, specialist has been providing and creating YouTube videos specific to each of the students she supports uh, so that working with families on, on their needs. We also highlight the work of our autism resource team what our START team is doing. Um, and then I find really important um, to also highlight the work of our clerical support team. Um, part of our technology deployment to our students um, over the past few weeks has also been uh, working with Grandview and our clerical support teams and then through um, Kyla's leadership as well to immobilize um, special ed uh, the special education health equipment from buildings into students' homes. So for some of our students, um, and some of your organizations, Hannah, I'm thinking particularly of yours, um, there is funding for that duplicity of equipment where SIA funds um, fund for within the school setting. And we have other organizations or ministries that help fund for home. For some of our students, there wasn't working equipment at home or as Grandview continues OT and PT services, they needed some of that equipment such as students AFOs um, and wheelchairs that were left at school for March break. Um, to be moved to the home environment. We also have a phenomenal video of one of our little guys riding his adaptive trike that his principal dropped off to his garage um, because mom and dad are both paramedics um, and unable to leave the home when they're off shift. And so the principal dropped it to the home and the family in appreciation sent us a little video of him gleefully riding down an empty street um, on his equipment. So that commitment to the services and the supports inclusive of the technology and health equipment um, has been um, there and steadfast as an underpinning to the distance learning program. Um, I will note because our programs and with the technology programs in secondary did have a fairly high um, stock of personal protective equipment um, based on the students we support in their needs as well as the technology programs in secondary and our facility services staff. Those were three central pools of PPE. Um, and we'll send you, if you hadn't had a chance to see it, the social media release on how much PPE the DDSB has transferred over to our local healthcare providers. Um, we're very proud of providing that support as well. So that's just a highlight of the roles, um, the redesign of the roles. And again, the leadership team has been pivotal. Um, our federation partners have been pivotal as it was CUPE um, in immobilizing supports in a different way for our kids. Uh, within the learn uh, within the distance learning model and maintaining service. So I'm just going to pause there and ask if there's any questions specific to that um, before turning over to Carolyn for the um, resources for families and youth. A comment um, for staff and that um, I have been having uh, conversations with other trustees from other boards. And it's, it's really nice to hear when they hear um, comments about how well Durham staff is doing to support our students with special needs. Um, the fact that the board particularly had approved uh, Chromebooks way back when uh, for seven to 12 has had um, a huge impact, but then the fact that our staff has managed to get those Chromebooks back out to the students. Um, and um, it's nowhere near as perfect on, on, on as far as what, but we've done a phenomenal job. And I just want to say uh, that um, to give that kudos to staff on the amount of work that they've been doing, as well as the technical support that they have received. Again, it's not perfect, but it's, it's definitely been recognized. Thank you, really, really greatly appreciate that and we'll pass that comment along. 
Uh, this is Hannah here from Easter Seals. And uh, yeah, I was just going to say that I think it's been great with the access to equipment at home. I know overall as Easter Seals Ontario, a lot of our families have been advocating for that as well. And so I think Durham was really quick in terms uh, in terms of giving access to families for that. Uh, so thank, that was uh, kudos to them as well. Thanks, Hannah. And uh, Andrea, I just like to, I just like to say it's worth repeating uh, that I have uh, received feedback from a number of families uh, about the uh, PPE equipment that's been do donated by the Durham board, uh, as well as the 3D printers that have been donated recently as well. Uh, parents uh, are very proud of the fact that, that the board has done that. I just feel that it's worth repeating. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And we'll share those statistics out. Um, I'll clip the infographic um, and email it out to SEAC afterwards. Um, quite proud to be able to support our frontline healthcare workers. Um, and that's inclusive of those in hospital settings, as well as many of our treatment-based partners and our residential care providers that have continued to provide service um, to children and youth in the area as well. Um, I will say too, um, just on the technology front, um, as I have responsibility for inclusive student services and the opportunity to support our CTCC or our care treatment custody and corrections programs, um, the deployment of devices um, went out with all of our students who are accessing through Grove School as well. Um, and yesterday was pleased to hear back from one of our partners, um, as an example, Frontenac, that 100% of the students accessing Grove through Frontenac now have their Chromebooks in front of them um, and they're continuing in their service plans as well. So um, a lot of collaboration, a lot of figuring out logistics um, for a board our size. Um, but we knew that it was really important to the kids and the families, um, and that gave a really strong moral imperative um, to get it done and get it done expediently um, to support them. So thank you for the feedback on all three of those items. Much appreciated. Um, we'll share it. Um, I'm glad the team is on the line tonight to hear it directly from you, um, and we'll certainly share it back with the senior team as well. Uh, Andrea, Hannah here again. Um, I haven't had a, a full chance to look at all of the learning uh, roles and responsibilities. I've looked at some of it, but I know that as Easter Seals, one of our big concerns was just the access to supports in terms of the children's treatment centers, uh, the ones that are closed at school. I'm not sure if um, that's already kind of on discussion or you're going to discuss more about that, but I think that's one of it. Um, and then it's a little bit off because uh, it's not specifically related to the school boards, but yeah. often in the school settings, we're also looking at access to ADP. And as we're looking at some of the, the equipment that might be needed and getting that going. So um, I know that's overall what Easter Seals is giving com um, communications to the ministries, but I just wanted great. to know how Durham was responding to that. And um, if you could speak to that, that'd be great. Great, so I think um, maybe if you and I can connect um, after tomorrow around the um, equipment um, and the specificities around that, we can bring it back to SEAC next month as well. Um, in terms of our treatment centers, I think kind of two angles. Um, so I think Hannah, um, when I look at the intersect with the, the kids um, service through Easter Seals, um, Grandview is our main partner um, for therapeutic services such as OT, PT and speech therapy. Uh, we've been working really closely with them. There was a couple weeks that uh, Kyla and I were on the phone about every other day with their clinical leads, as well as their executive director, um, Lorraine, just looking at that um, from an equipment perspective and equipment as embedded in the continuity therapy that um, they've been able to mobilize. Um, so we've been looking at um, all of that. They're, they're trying to go to that virtual care um, as well. Um, and reaching out to families. So just that connection. And then our next kind of connect on that is to triangulate that back with our principals to let them know which of their students are continuing to access services. So they're able to support with their leaders as well. Um, in terms of uh, clinical treatment on a mental health side, um, again, the team continues to meet. We're together about every other week um, as a, a regional team, including up to yesterday. Um, with an update um, of partners such as the Durham Family Court Clinic, um, Rose of Durham, um, Pinewoods um, at uh, Lake Ridge, Oshawa, 
and just looking at how do we continue to evolve to meet a need um, that is going to grow through this time um, as students are, and learners are out of um, routines and patterns and have additional stressors, um, very well grounded um, in situations. Um, and the flip side of it, um, for us, some of our learners who um, are quite comfortable being at home and not um, in the community or in a social setting of school and how will we work to support um, what will be um, a very difficult transition for them from that uh, very comfortable setting. So um, our partners, um, a couple are, are reopened. Um, so Korea, it, Korea is back open um, to some degree. The settlement um, services have remained open to some degree. Um, our partners working in the hospital have tried to pivot and are trying to find locations out of hospital so they can be more um, sidewalk accessible. Um, but we continue to work together and happy to bring, we didn't put that in the roles of documents because they're not our staff directly. Um, that the roles of DOC really speaks to the staff funded through Ministry of Ed and through board funding, um, but happy to put a compilation of that together um, and send it out to SEAC as well, or bring it forward next month um, as those services become more mobilized. For many of our partners, they've maintained their residential services, but they've had to do a close down of their storefront um, or direct daily service. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so with that, um, it is my pleasure, and I'm going to share my screen to put the um, tool up on your screen, if that's okay, so you won't see Carolyn. Um, but you'll certainly hear from her and the leadership of her team working with the other clinical staff and our mental health partners to put a resource together for families. So I'm going to throw that up and uh, turn it over to Carolyn. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um... Uh, thanks for having us virtually. Um, I just uh, am briefly going to be talking about this um, resource tool that we have that's up on, on the screen that you can see. And really the genesis um, for this tool was the fact that a lot of information was being uh, sort of emailed and sent out and many of us, the chiefs and, and other folks on our team, we're getting lots of resources. This is a great resource. We should get this for families. There's some pieces here that families are gonna need. And lots of our school education colleagues were also pulling together some lists for their schools. So um, one of the pieces that we recognized was that if, if, if I'm a family whose circumstances are changing fairly rapidly in the community, I may not be able to have the time to go back and look at um, reams of emails and all sorts of information that comes from various sources to sort of look at that. So we wanted to try and compile in a one-stop shop as much as we can. It's a it's a growing shop. Um, it's it's uh, it's expanding as we go. But what we wanted to do was to provide some like a landing spot for our families and for students as well, so that they could come and find some information that may not be. Uh, what was important to them last week might not be what's important to them this week as this uh, information changes and shifts for our, for our families and our community. Um, so in very, very short order, I think we did five working days, we were able to take an idea from, from a genesis of an idea to uh, connecting in with our creative services and our IT folks, because that's not my specialty for sure. Um, and uh, Dr. Graffy and uh, Lisa Drake and also Dr. Sarah Schlein on our um, psychological services team. Uh, we all sourced and mined some resources from our teams and from our um, our, our colleagues and people in the community that we rely on and that we lean on for our services for our kids and our families. And we were able to create this link and it lands, it lives rather on the landing page for our um, DDSB website. So if a family were to click on the DDSB website, um, it's, it's right on that landing page. And it looks like this picture with this family here with the COVID-19 title. Um, and what we tried to do was really um, keep it as tight as, as possible just around. So for families um, where they may have uh, parents and guardians with children, so, so kids more in the kind of elementary school area, um, but it also might be for kids, uh, you know, they're not students yet, maybe they're just wee ones who are just starting to uh, engage with the notion of coming into school. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So we we really sort of chunked it or clumped it, or I like to say bucketed it into things that we thought might make sense for parents. So supporting their child their child's learning. So what does that look like at home and keeping on some schedules? And Kyla and her um, her group were able to really give us some great information to be able to set up a home environment, routines and structures. Um, so some sort of quick hits and quick tips for folks to be able to do some of that oh, stuff. Thanks, it's thanks. By, by, <laughs> by no means is it is it a complete uh, a completed document and it, as I said it continues to grow but in each of these sections we also have some links to um, things like social stories to talk about COVID, um, some pieces around uh, how to support mental health in the home as well as um, your your own as a caregiver your own self-care and and how to sort of make sure that you're managing yourself as an adult to try and make sure that you're okay so that you can be okay for your for your child and your student um, we also have uh, partnered with our mental health lead and our mental health folks in safe schools who um, have also provided many of the the supports and the links um, and you can see many of our, our colleagues from the community partners are here um, I think the other thing that I'd like to highlight is that we also have a section that's for, for students, for teens and tweens as well, but we also have a section that's for, um, for students so that when we have our, those kids, many of you folks may know, I mean, our, our, our teenagers are very uh, good with online tools and online um, uh, uh, access. And so we were able to give, so you'll see supports for students. There's lots of stuff, Bounce Back Ontario, Kids Helpline, um, places where they can get some extra supports uh, for themselves around their own mental uh, well-being. And then in each section, we you'll see an essential Durham resources for families and a, um, a quick reference guide. And there's also one for families that's a bit longer. That longer one uh, was compiled by our social work team uh, with some help from our uh, psychological services colleagues. It's a 26 page document that's really quite, it's got links, live links to community resources, everything from food banks to care monger groups, um, you know, income security, all these pieces. And we have committed to updating that weekly, I have to say, uh, where I think we're, we are a week behind already, but um, to try and keep these links as live um, as possible so that as the circumstances change, particularly with government funding and those, um, those pieces, we're able to keep this as up to date as possible for our families. Um, the resources in general, uh, the links and whatnot, we are uh, trying to vet those every few days so we can make sure that they're still active. Many of the host sites, the agencies and the communities um, are uh, um, maybe moving some of their resources around on their home documents. And so we've had to make sure that the links are, are not broken. Um, and as we come across more resources, we are certainly adding them uh, weekly as we can so that we, we try and stay as up to date with, um, with the best resources possible. As I say, it is a work in progress. We're building this shop. Um, so uh, if there are some things that people would like to see in there, by all means, please let us know and we can make sure that those links and those resources go in for our families. I hope that that's clear for everybody. And if there's any questions, I'm not sure how we get them, but. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, this is Hannah again from Easter Seals. Uh, looks great. Uh, my only thought, and I think even Easter Seals, we're, all, we're, we're looking around for different online resources about how to support uh, students with physical disabilities and their families. I think we have such a limited access to the regular supports that we would normally have. So I'd, I'd love to see a little bit more there around the physical disabilities part. Uh, there's a lot of sometimes lifting that is now required more so from families than there used to be. So. Um, uh, like I said, I don't have tons of resources yet. I think we're still building on them, but uh, perhaps if there's any additional resources you guys or staffing you could put to look for some of that things, I, I think that would be really helpful for families with children or students with physical disabilities. Most certainly. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, that's well taken. Thank you. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, Kyla's just indicated as well. 
um, that uh, we do have an ergonomist um, that we work with around safe work practices generally for our EAs um, and our facility services staff around lifting um, of students um, for our EAs and equipment for our custodians. Um, so we'll do a reach out um, to her. Um, to ask for her to contribute that. Um, thanks very much for that feedback in terms of something a family would be looking for. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to welcome, thanks, Carolyn. Um, Carolyn sharing internet with a child finishing a university exam. So we understand the priority is in another room in your house this evening. Um, so what we would like to do is welcome uh, Kyla McKee and Lisa Drake to share um, just the DDSB overview of um, distance learning at this time. Okay. Okay. Uh, just, just sorry, Kyla. Just before we move on, I just want to remind everybody: uh, if you could put your hand up, uh, if you have a question or want to make a comment, I know Craig was trying to get in a little earlier. We are going to have a discussion period right after this uh, to bring up any questions or concerns that that we have with um, the distance learning. But I, I just like to remind people of that moving forward, so that uh, we we can keep some sort of order and that everybody gets a chance to speak. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Carla. Thanks, Eva. I'm just going to share my screen as well. Um, of course, I have so many things going. I have to figure out the right one. There we go. So I have a quick presentation just to share with you that Lisa and I have, have collaborated on. So she'll jump in. I'll keep sharing my screen when it's Lisa's turn to chat about the uh, slides that are there. Um, rather than taking the entire screen from a, a, presenta a presentation or a presenting mode, just gonna keep them a little bit smaller for now, um, but we are going to send this out to you just to be able to see after tonight. But it's really just to give you a quick overview of the distance learning that has been sort of um, prepared and the coordination of many departments, um, ours included, in terms of supporting students in a new, very new learning model of distance learning learning um, with a need for accommodations and a variety of other supports. So I've got a few snapshots from a back end that you wouldn't see um, because it's on the staff side, which is why we wanted to be able to share it with you tonight. But um, just as the five day turnaround from Genesis to production um, for Carolyn's uh, team resource or the, the very comprehensive resource that she just shared, um, we also had a very quick turnaround to try to provide some resources and supports for all of our teachers as they not only needed to figure out what they were going to provide for distance learning, but also to ensure that they had resources and supports available to them to ensure we were operating from an inclusive model. So um, there are a number of things that are there. Um, from our side, we would be able to go into student and curriculum support and select distance learning. And so just showing you where it is again, but recognizing that you um, wouldn't have access to it specifically. When teachers would go in, we intentionally were able to add a button. So the screen is broken down into resources for a variety of different grades, as you can see there. But we were able to put right alongside the supporting of inclusive education. So the slides are just sort of gonna follow the clicks that you would make if you were to select supporting inclusive education you would then move into a screen that had an inclusion of a universal design for learning area with the intent of it being twofold. One, certs and special education heads role is to coach and support the many teachers who are developing resources, providing programming and learning activities and wanting to help remind them that the universal design where we put students with special education needs at the heart of the planning and then build out from there and that there are some very simple strategies and accommodations that can be put in place that actually benefit all learners. And so that's the universal design model. So we've provided some resources for teachers and then certs can also continue to use them as they work and support those teachers through the distance learning that they're providing. Um, giving us some opportunities to really share some important information, but um, provide that support right alongside as we all embarked on this new journey um, rather rapidly and with not a lot of preparation. If you were to click that universal design button, you'd move into this next area. And you can see that on the left hand side of the slide here, that there are some sections around getting started. In the getting started section, it has some helpful hints around how to use certain things, how to um, have some tools and training around different platforms and um, technology resources and supports. We also have an area that looks at language needs, 
We have some math needs, gifted learners, um, tying into French immersion and, and uh, the dual layer of core French, French immersion, but then a special education layer that may be needed. Some very specific resources around supporting students with autism spectrum disorder. And then we've also got a team of speech and language pathologists adding some language and the hearing resource team adding some hearing resources as well. So really looking at as they provide learning activities to continue to add accommodation to any place that they can with consideration from people who have a really good background and knowledge to share those resources with teachers at large, um, knowing that we have around 11,000 of those teachers that we're trying to support in providing those learning activities. Within the other space, if you were to choose supporting inclusive um, student learning or distance learning, you also have an area for our special education class teachers. So each of our class types has a button that allows them to move to, you can see one highlighted here, that it says join the practical learning program Google community. So a teacher of that program can click that button and it will take them to a section that looks like this, where within that same area for teachers of that particular program type, it has a bit of a discussion forum and a number of resources that can be shared. They can post ideas, ask questions. And for each and every one of those class types, we have a leadership team that includes members from each of the, special, the teams. So we have speech and language pathologists, social workers, psych and uh, facilitators all taking the lead to add additional support. But we also have encouraged teachers to make sure they're connecting with their ISS team that's attached to their school as those team members would know those students best. So this is more of that con uh, consultation lens as opposed to specific supports for students and uh, giving that layered of support there. So um, that is sort of the piece around the many, and, and I know that was a very quick overview and there's an awful lot that's actually embedded in those pieces that I just shared with you, but just wanted to give you a very brief scope of the resource that's been developed to help teachers as they move into this area of distance learning and wanting to show how we have ensured that the supporting of students with special education strengths and needs has gone right alongside all other curriculum resources that are being provided at every grade level for every program type and uh, trying to ensure that we have the accommodation and modification lens and filter, but also done through a universal design as the core of each of those pieces. So I'm gonna hand it off to Lisa and mute myself um, and uh, be able to have the next layer around how the other inclusive student services team members are also supporting students. Thanks, Kyla. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, so to pick up where Kyla left off, the, the thing that makes um, it really exciting to be a clinical support staff within the education system is that we get to have this very multifaceted role. So we do get to work with the families and the students, but we also get to work with the educators and collaborate with all of our education partners. So as distance learning has started to ramp up, we have spent a lot of time working with our education partners around helping to get this off the ground. So one of the things that we've been doing is we've been participating on some of the working groups that get tier one resources out to those educators that are good for all students, um, specifically focusing on some of those language and literacy resources that are so needed. We've also been able to respond to the requests and we have had so many requests from so many educators around um, support <laughs> for students with various learning profiles. So an example might be um, a cert reaching out to someone like a speech pathologist or to a, a, one of the psychological services staff. You know, I, I've got these kids in grade three that have reading comprehension challenges. What have you got that I can use within the distance learning platform in order to help them and meet their needs too? So that there's been a lot of that happening in the last couple of weeks. And then the other piece is that the, um, the small class uh, supports that Kailash uh, highlighted for you within the, within the distance learning page, all of the uh, ISS team members have been working together in order to uh, provide the right amount of supports for those teachers and the most appropriate supports in order to help them to um, support their students from afar, which is new learning for everyone. Kyla, can you give me the next slide, please? So the other piece um, that we've that has been ongoing is continuing to connect with the students and the families um, who are currently on our caseload. 
So the, the students who we had been previously involved with and still have a current active plan of care with, uh, we wanted to make sure that we are still um, supporting them as best we can as we were figuring out the the way to do this in this new world. And so because we do have um, some some considerations that we need to keep at the forefront as, as health professionals around confidentiality and um, and ensuring that we have a secure platform. And Steve Graffy is going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, we are, we were, have in the current moment been connecting primarily over the telephone or over email, um, which we know are secure connections. But the purpose of this has been to maintain the relationships that we have with these families and with these students and to check in with them. That's what everyone has started with. How are you doing? What's going on for you? How, how are available are you to receive um, information right now? Um, we have been providing any service follow-up where it's been appropriate to carry over from what we've been doing prior to the pandemic starting. Um, and then where appropriate, also connecting them with uh, the community resources that they really need to, um, to help them to find solid ground right now. So I'm going to pause there, and I'm going to I'm going to mute myself. Steve Graffy is going to come um, come on and talk a little bit about our next steps in terms of um, providing virtual services. Then I'm going to come back in, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what the interveners and interpreters have been doing. So I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that uh, I mean, what part of what Lisa is saying is that, of course, as a, uh, the professionals around the table. Uh, we are very alert and attuned to our own professional standards around continuity of services. Uh, that's a standard of practice for social workers, for psychologists, for uh, speech and language uh, pathologists. And so we, we've been very alert to the fact that we're you know, naturally out of a March break is one thing, but certainly in terms of a uh, prolonged um, school closure uh, by function of the pandemic, uh, it creates the challenge of how we maintain that standard. And I think that uh, a lot of our folks have been struggling a little bit with that. I just have to share that with you. Uh, they've certainly been doing the reach out via phone um, and through other methods as well. Um, and we want to look at sort of uh, how it is that we get back into the types of services that we more typically do because we're in the business of working with people and oftentimes it's face to face with people. That's why we're in our professions. We provide those types of services. So uh, working uh, at a distance uh, or only simply by phone um, creates a bit of a, a challenge and kind of goes against a little bit of the professional uh, inclination that most of our staff have. So we are looking at uh, virtual platforms. We're looking to elevate services to reactivate uh, more of that face time type of contact um, with our families, with our students, with our schools. Uh, relationship, uh, we've been using that word over and over again, uh, how we best put services around, how we best support students in a system is relationally. We, uh, we have uh, obviously student to teacher, uh, student to their families, um, but professional support staff develop relationships either directly with the students, with the families, or with the school staff supporting students in the right way. So, um, you know, getting back into a, a level of contact uh, that allows us to have that face-to-face -face dialogue, that opportunity to converse, not in a stilted way by phone, but actually just, I mean, it is fairly stilty in a virtual world. I don't lose sight of that, but by the same token, it is nice to be able to see who you're speaking to, to have, uh, you know, responsiveness, to have that conversation point, to have the nonverbal sometimes you might get in terms of some of the uh, ideas, suggestions, or points of reference that you have in your conversation. So. So that all that is to say is that we're looking at a virtual platform. We've been undertaking uh, this uh, exploration um, in the last two weeks. Uh, we recognize that uh, a couple of pieces are required there. Not only is it our familiarity with the legislative guidelines that um, predicate the level of privacy that's required when we talk about student uh, information directly. Um, it's also our, our obviously professional college uh, guidelines that uh, dictate that as well. Um, and we've been looking at um, contact points with our legal counsel and with our uh, IT uh, specialists. Um, this is an issue that's obviously not specific to TDSB. All boards are looking at the same type of flurry of activity to enter into a virtual level of service delivery. Um, we're, I guess, behind healthcare in that sense because they have, a, of course, telehealth and that type of thing. Um, some of our um, boards that are in remote areas perhaps have the fast track on it because they do virtual platforms. 
Um, but a lot of other boards are in that exploration and relying upon their um, legal, their IT folks to guide them. Uh, there hasn't been a landing point nor a direction from the ministry or the respective colleges. Um, I think it's been left with the uh, individual boards to look at their um, the needs that they have when they look at professional service delivery um, and look what uh, look at what the, you know, the platforms could be to best deliver those types of services. So we're in that process. Uh, we've gone through legal uh, in terms of their advice. Uh, we've um, um, left it with IT. There is some notification uh, at last count that we'll get a response from IT shortly. Um, and once we land, of course, what we want to do is to be able then to um, basically kick it into gear. I think staff are champing at the bit to get back to the typical service delivery as much as it what can be typical in this uh, context. Um, but that is to say to join schools for team meetings, to join uh, families for family meetings, to, to discuss uh, programming as best befitting of the needs of a student, to discuss test results if there are test results, uh, to provide input for IPRCs, to uh, have a family contact uh, around community access points that is much more personalized. And certainly for the uh, direct service of folks uh, our, to our department through social work, uh, when we're meeting with students, uh, that was supposed to be a one week break, see you after March break, and now we're into a protracted uh, um, delay in terms of that type of service delivery. So definitely a lot of folks are wanting to activate uh, on the count of a virtual platform. What we've done behind the scenes is to ensure that all professional services staff are alert and attuned and up to date on professional standards uh, around virtual service delivery. Uh, that includes the aspect of informed consent, which is different. What we have is consent for services as they exist now. So we need to shuffle that a little bit to tweak it, to ensure that uh, we are outlining to our families, to our uh, students that in a virtual platform, there are risks and benefits. Um, benefits obviously is the contact. Um, we're trying to mitigate risks relative to ensuring our platform is secure. It is consistent with uh, uh, directions out of PIPEDA, PHIPA, and FIPA, um, and that legal has been looking that, at that in the right way. Um, but we have to, again, adjust our informed consent uh, procedures to, in, to reflect that and make sure that we document that. So our first stop is to definitely get back into reactivation of services with our current referrals uh, that we left off with. That's our continuity of service um, uh, professional guideline. Uh, and certainly most of our schools and our educators are saying, please, can you pick up where you left off and carry on with business here? So uh, again, our, our folks are eager to do that, absolutely. We're also alert to the fact that um, given the times, given the stress points within the times and what that does uh, in terms of trickle down to families and, and parenting and kids within the context of a family, and what that means in terms of their own level of uncertainty in terms of just getting back to school and seeing their friends in a regular way and, and that type of thing. That those stress points that, that can affect, affects, affects all of us, but certainly can affect some of our um, students um, in a perhaps a, a little bit more of a, a magnified way for different reasons. Um, there's a lot of schools that wanna activate on new referrals as well. And we need to be responsive to that as professions uh, around the, uh, the table and ensuring that uh, we uh, are attuned to those students and are prepared for needs as well. So just to reactivate uh, current referrals and our next stop will be to pick up on uh, new referrals as they come forth and be ready to uh, gear up for um, a, you know, a more suitable level of service delivery that most of us would probably be more comfortable with anyways. As much as one can be in a virtual format, at least we get to see our, our contact points in, in that format. So. So that's where we're at. Um, and uh, again, if there are questions coming forth, I may wrap, perhaps after we finish this section, um, we'll open it up for questions around that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so I'm just going to um, finish off this, uh, pres this part of the presentation to just uh, highlight what the interveners and the ASL interpreters have been doing in the last couple of weeks. Um, so these are two groups of, of people who are incredibly dedicated to the students that they support. And um, I've been absolutely amazed by how well they have just jumped right into the deep end with whatever their classroom teachers have been trying to set up for distance learning and working hand in hand with them in order to take whatever the, the tasks are or the format has been um, from teacher to teacher 
and adapt it in order to meet the needs of the students that they work with. So as soon as distance learning got started, the interveners interpreters were working um, with those kids directly um, virtually. Uh, the, the, ASL, the ASL interpreters, especially at the secondary level, have had um, to think about it in, in two different ways. And so these are um, terms that have been coined um, within our group since this, this distance learning has started, the idea of synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. So for, um, especially in secondary, there are there are more occurrences of a teacher actually running a class live with some of their students. So we're thinking about that as synchronous learning and within a, a situation like that, live ASL interpretation can be required for those students who, um, who have that support. And so they're figuring out the right platform um, and the best format in order to, to do that live interpretation while the teacher is teaching. The other um, scenario that we are working with is asynchronous learning, where the teacher is posting a video or um, some other kind of um, uh, material for the students to access through the Google Classroom. And so um, a lot of times when it's a video, the interpreters are having to um, watch the video. They're being sent the video ahead of time and they record themselves signing, um, interpreting what is on the video. And then they're learning very quickly how to overlay that interpreted video on top of the teacher's video. And so it can be posted as a, um, a unified um, a piece of medium for the students. So it's been a, a real learning curve from uh, for them and they have just taken the technology and figured it out as quickly as they can. So um, my hat is off to them for sure. The interveners um, who work directly with the deafblind students, um, they have all been doing such um, unique work from student to student, all of their, their needs really are quite diverse. And so what specifically they do from student to student, um, you know, is really quite um, unique. So, but on the whole, what they're doing is they're adapting the material that the teachers are um, are producing and they're working directly with the students and sometimes outside of um, the, that time with the teacher. The interveners are meeting with parents and with uh, the hearing resource teachers and, uh, and the students that they are supporting and, and helping them to complete the schoolwork that is being assigned. So it's been an Im impressive collaboration from, uh, from, our team, from all of our teams together um, and the educators that we work with. And it is, it's just been incredible to watch in such a fast time. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute myself now. So all combined, um, really upholding um, the human rights accommodation needs of our students, um, as the team is referenced, in a time of great pivot um, and quick pace change. And so all of these resources and supports, um, we would consider them all in development um, and ongoing to be refined both at a system level and right down to the individual student level. Um, and as the team referenced as well too, we know that the situation for students and families um, as the school closures um, become extended are gonna ebb and flow um, in terms of their needs, in terms of distance learning um, and services and supports. So we really wanna make sure that the team's able to pivot those supports um, as needed by the kids, the families, and certainly um, their classroom educators being central to that and supporting our school leaders um, in leading that um, provision of supports and programs at a community level. Um, so we do acknowledge that everything is a work in progress um, and that uh, feedback within that as we continue to shape um, is really essential. Um, and so we hope that provided you with an overview tonight. Um, apologize for the, um, the thoroughness a little bit um, in that, but open it up for questions. Um, and happy to take them tonight and also happy to, um, as Carla said, the. PowerPoint will come out to you um, and you have the roles of doc happy to take feedback um, through email or to individually connect um, with any of you or um, through Eva as well. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, okay, so I know Craig had his hand up before. So we're going to start with Craig and then move to Donna and then Christine. Uh, anybody else has any questions, um, we'll, we'll uh, get to them uh, in, in, try to get to them in, in order. Okay. Uh, Craig, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, it's going to be a little bit back, Andrea, and it's, and it's, it's a little bit to you. In general, um, 
I, I, I'm getting um, positive feedback on a lot of things that are happening, and and I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that several people have said that, but I've also heard people mention that there have been some obstacles. <laughs> I think it is important that we recognize there's been some obstacles. I've heard from a few people in our community um, around assumptions that students, because they are younger and from a different generation, will just magically adapt to technology. Um, but I think we, we should keep in mind that technology, even for young people or teens, can be tremendously anxiety producing um, in terms of, you know, we, they suddenly just sort of got hit with now we're going to be doing this stuff. And so it's been a little bit overwhelming. So I, I just wanted to, to mention that because there is a bit of a theme that somehow, you know, students just dovetail into these new, uh, these new uh, means of delivering education. And it has been troublesome for some. Um, so on that note, because some have been um, a little paralyzed, frankly, in terms of, you know, what do I do? We're getting overwhelmed with stuff. I noticed in the document, Andrea, the, um, the distance learning doc, which is which great. I love that, that you're putting that out. It does have a reoccurring theme uh, under responsibility for educators about um, considering equity as a foundation to all decisions. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to what that could mean, right? In, in terms of we can get technology and we can deliver stuff but you can still have so many dynamics that prevents the student from being able to focus or get on or sustain concentration, whether it's an ADHD kid or whatever the case may be. Um, is that where these types of things would fall in? And can I'm, I'm hoping that it'll find its way into some of the narrative for our educators that are working with the students. It's great that we have the documents, but I think being able to recognize that, okay, I've got a student who has checked out here, um, is that where we see the consider equity as a foundation to all decisions coming in? Um, so thank you for that um, comment. We would agree. Um, we have educators that are highly dialed into a digital platform and those that are learning and students along the way. I think um, when we look at our youngest learners, um, often those are families who are working off an iPad. So um, some of our educators have propagated links out um, and then that makes it challenging. So it is a work in progress. Um, when we look at um, equity as a foundation, that's really where, um, as Kai said, um, we wanted the um, accommodations and universal design for learning to be a core foundation. So as people are redesigning education, looking at what accommodation looks like as being firmly embedded within that, um, a foundation for distance learning is conversation with families. Um, so the relationships between school and home, and if it's not between school and home, that's where um, inclusive student services staff, um, I'll use the example that um, some, of, some of our families have reached out to Carolyn's team because there's a connect with social work um, and looking at that. Um, Emran, can you just mute? Sorry, I think we're hearing background noise. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, and reaching out. So to, to us, it doesn't matter who the family's reaching out to, just that um, there is that engagement and reach out. And we're gonna need to dial up and dial down um, as families move through that. So I would really encourage um, any family to have an authentic conversation with the educator, um, knowing that that teacher, um, if they're sending out um, list lessons um, and learning for a, a classroom, they're trying to meet the needs of the parent that's um, wanting kind of a in-class model transfer to home, but also the parent who's saying, I can, I'm just getting through my day um, and finding that placement of activities. And then the accommodations are in and the equity are in giving that permission for it to look and sound different um, or to send it out in the way that the family needs it packaged. So we're building it. Um, we're building it and tweaking it. And we know we've got a ways to go. Um, I think we've gone a long way. Um, but I think um, still lots to go. I also think from an equity perspective, um, we continue on that journey at looking at the resources and tools that we're sharing. Um, and this is a really good opportunity to put that equity lens um, to decisions around what tools and resources we're sharing with our families and making sure um, that that representation of identity and home circumstance um, and families and that level of stress. We have said to teachers, we, um, from a mental health perspective, learning should not be based on COVID-19, so not a class assignment of journaling during this time, because you're not with the student to know how that's landing for that family, um, but to be responsive. 
So one of the other things that um, we're doing and just having in the mix now, um, Craig, to your point too, around engagement, for sure, um, and what that looks like and sounds like, um, is we generally have our attendance matter strategy that's looked at um, getting kids into classrooms because our general principle is they can't take advantage of the supports and services unless they're physically at school. Um, so we're rewriting that as engagement matters right now and Carolyn's leading that. Um, and we'll be asking our administrators next week to share with their family and school superintendents who haven't you heard from or whose frequency of contact has become irregular for that student or dropped off and then why? Because it might be that the family's feeling pressured and because the distance learning hasn't dialed down to where they can um, have an access point, they've forfeited the opportunity. Um, and so we really wanna be looking at who those connectors are from the family's perspective um, and making sure that they're connected in. We also respect that some of our families during this time have said that their learning will all be life skills based through cooking and family activities. Um, and we'll see them when we re-enter classrooms. And so we'll also be encouraging just um, a regular pattern, not overwhelmed, but at those critical times, a birthday, an interest, or as class lists are planned to make sure that families know that we're still thinking of them and that their kids are very much part of um, the planning. So evolving, um, but if there's ever any families specifically, um, please have them reach out to the school or have us, them reach out to us. Um, we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Donna. Thank you. You actually answered uh, a couple of my questions, especially when uh, a family may opt out to uh, just do a life skills based uh, learning um, because of uh, the situation that they are in. And I'm glad to hear that there's still that connection, though, and hopefully the family can share some of those little tidbits of what they are doing sort of thing to to the teacher to say, hey, this is what I'm doing. And it sounds like that's also happening. Um, I had actually had a couple of questions. One was around um, asynchronous learning uh, interpretation and that um, how much of a delay is there? Because I know Carla had mentioned about uh, getting a video in advance, but there might not be a possibility of that. So how um, are we dealing with maybe those notes or comments that might be valuable to the student after the fact, after the last one is given, um, to get that information to that student? Um, that is one of the questions. And then um, the other question is more along uh, supporting the student um, that um, has uh, wasn't on our caseload um, and how they get in touch with um, with staff uh, or supports um, when they might not be comfortable um, having that discussion um, in where they're contacting because it might involve people around this that they're living with or cohabitating with. So those are the sort of the two questions. Thanks, I'll start and then um, ask that the team jump in uh, with any item that I miss on that one. Um, so in terms of the interpretation, um, we're working on it because as teachers are trying to build and construct their program, they're not planning on that regular cycle of five days of learning and they're morphing and twisting. Um, and we want them to be really responsive to a student. So if a student said, can you find me a video that shows me that? We want the teacher's response to be absolutely and I'll work with your interpreter if it's not um, already provided with those supports. Um, what the hearing um, and vision teams are also doing is putting together a list of kind of recommended strategies and resources too, because ideally if a teacher can use one that already has accommodation built in, um, then that can be more synchronous or closely um, in the asynchronous learning. So um, in terms of how are we doing system-wide data, I, I don't think I would be able to provide an accurate snapshot. Um, but again, if there's a particular student or family reaching out that's finding that a challenge, I would really encourage them to either connect with the teacher and just identify that, um, contact the administrator. Our principals are amazing and our vice principals at being responsive. Um, and then they can always reach out to our team too. So I know uh, Lisa's lead for those teams um, always appreciates hearing from families. Um, your second point, um, and it is um, 
with a bit of a heavy heart um, that we've had many conversations um, that we do know that we have students that were in risk situations prior um, to the pandemic um, and that um, the stress levels at this time are gonna increase that for families um, and that the risk or occurrence of violence um, will likely be higher. Um, that was part of the conversation with Children's Aid yesterday in terms of their experiencing globally um, a drop in referrals. Um, and that's certainly occurring locally because most of the referrals come from educators, police and doctors. And those three services aren't having the same face-to-face -face contact. Um, so one of the things, again, that our, our clinical teams have done is prepped um, a tip sheet for educators on what does identifying risk and responding to risk look like in a distance learning situation. So awareness of kind of some of those indicators or hints that something may be um, in a risk situation. And that's where part of that tip sheet is really to get um, the educator, again, with the administrator, that duty to report uh, because CAS is still doing wellness checks and we can certainly um, use our police partners as well. Um, again, an imperfect science, um, but everybody coming in with a compassion and care and understanding that sometimes circumstances and the stress level is the impetus for that. But then how do we be responsive to that um, for our kids and youth? Um, so we'll continue to reach out. I think that's one thing that um, partners such as um, the Children's Help Phone um, and seeing them take a higher intake of um, trainees um, and increase their services, the attunement of our team, the attunement of school teams, um, just really critical. But I also think it goes to those tier one strategies of continuing to communicate that our teams are available as families enter into higher stress to try and get us in sooner to help mitigate that even occurring. Um, comes back to that relationship and trust factor, but um, certainly training and linking back to Craig's point as well, understanding from an equity lens and uh, culturally relevant um, and responsive kind of pedagogy approach to that too, that homes look and sound different. Some of our homes are louder or quieter than others. Um, sometimes um, when you're working with one student online, there could be a parent or caregiver working with another student in another part of a house and that may look or sound different. And so just making sure that as we uphold our duty to report and our duty to care, um, that we have an equity and CRRP lens um, and not a biasness to where that level sits, um, but ensuring that uh, where there is a child in youth and risk where we suspect that, um, that there's a follow through. Um, so we're working at that and I think it links back to the um, engagement matter strategy and the call for data that will come from administrators um, next month or next week, sorry, um, as we look at that. Um, oh, so thanks, Craig. Um, I'll just discuss. read through your comment in a second and then, uh, um, but I don't know, um, Carolyn or Lisa will step in if I've missed anything on those two. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Go, oh, sorry, Steve. Yeah, sorry, I, I was just going to uh, um, add a little bit uh, to Donna's question around uh, kids that uh, um, may not feel in a position where they can turn to their families and speak to the needs that they're experiencing relative to level of distress um, and an elevated level of anxiety or mental health need. I think that you know, it's interesting at these times, you kind of hope that some of what you've invested into the system in terms of mental health literacy for educators as they're doing distance learning, that they're, uh, they're able to activate some of that knowledge and, and be attuned and, and, and alert to some of those indicators that uh, that training uh, has been offering to them, uh, how to be uh, astute, how to be alert, how to be uh, sensitive to a kid shows on your screen or a kid reaches out in some manner and seems different to you, is that the right time to ask some questions? Um, sometimes kids may not be sort of in that position where they can turn to uh, a loved one, a family member of, of the like. So, you know, we're hoping on that count that that pans out. I think that we've also, as Carolyn uh, referenced earlier, that uh, kids are very digitally savvy. So if they ever land on the DDSB website, there is that section there for them as to well, where would I go? There's a section here for me. I'm having some issues. I'm having struggles. Um, you know, oh, there's kids' health phones there. Oh, there's like this anxiety site. Um, and that might be an entry point in. We are challenged in some way. As to what they're providing 
So we're alert to what they're doing and how they're doing it. I think once we once we perhaps kind of nudge it over to a virtual platform, like I said, we might be more responsible, hopefully more responsible. Um, sorry, <laughs> I cut out, sorry. Um, we're gonna be more responsive to the, the needs of those students. Um, and historically what's been the case for our high school educators in particular is the fact that they do know that there's a way of rooting kids to referrals to second social work um, that relies upon their consent. And, um, and we're hoping that that can play as well um, in the go forward. Carolyn, did you have something to say to that as well? Hi, yeah, I, I just, I echo all of those pieces. I think the other the other piece is that many of our, our um, neurosocial workers and their psych staff are still really connected with their school community. And so sometimes things sort of come about through those more informal places that we're, we're able to, we're having to do business slightly differently. So being able to connect in with those kids that, as you say, maybe online who don't feel comfortable to be able to reach out to say something's happening, or even just, um, I think it was, if it's, I think it was Craig's point that um, kids who may be struggling with, um, you know, connecting in the, um, the, the digital world, I think what we're what we're alive to and 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 um, watching is that this may change over time for people as these the sands shift for families, but also as we're still I mean what are we Thursday so we've been in in distance learning for about I don't know if I do the math eight working days or something so I think that this is going to shift a little bit more and every time there's an extension to the um, emergency uh, state of emergency piece that we just received we're aware that maybe that receives that that means a bit of a spike in stress for people too so we are alive and attuned to try and figure out how we how we um, coordinate and we are in um, I have a good relationship with our Children's Aid Society and the Indigenous Children's Aid Society in the um, in the district so we we keep those conversations going thanks and can I just um, clarify about the um, the interpreters and the videos Here, I'll turn my video on my video on Hi, um, so thank you for asking that. It's a really great opportunity to just clarify what that looks like uh, when teachers are creating a video that they would post within their Google community to share with their, with their students. What's happening is, is that the interpreters are receiving the video well in advance. So they'll receive that video a few days beforehand for the students in that class who do require ASL interpretation. So when they have that, that video, they have the time to, um, to produce the interpreted video and then overlay them together. So they, it would never be a situation in which um, the, the video would be out there without that interpreted piece so that that student would have the have access to the video at the same time the other classmates would have the access to the video themselves. So um, the teachers and the interpreters are working really well together um, across multiple um, different modes of, of providing distance learning and um, every, we're checking in every week just to make sure that we uh, I appreciate that we recognize uh, that we need to be flexible and that we're open to feedback, uh, that this is a, is a work in progress for sure. But I wanna say that I think these programming supports are excellent and very comprehensive. Uh, I guess my, I have a couple of, couple of things. One is around the communication question. <clears throat> and that is something that I find, uh, I, I always struggle with. We have uh, amazing programs but just, you know, how are we getting that information out to our families? Um, that's, that's one thing I, I, I ask. Um, I know that all of these programs and the certs in the school uh, are supporting teachers, the teachers programs, which as I say is fantastic. But if somebody could just explain to me how we're getting this information out to parents, and then the second thing that I wanted to know about is uh, that um, it I, I don't know whether it was Kyla or Lisa mentioned that we um, are connecting with the families uh, of those kids on, on, uh, on your caseloads. Um, and I, I just like to know where we are with that uh, only because I have heard some comments, questions around it, uh, will we still be 
a hearing from uh, our social worker and so on. So um, uh, I think that's uh, that's it. And, and I think the other thing, um, Andrea, you mentioned our families reaching out to you, your group. Uh, how, how are we getting that information to them? And um, where would parents find that sort of thing? So I guess I'm, it's mostly around the communication piece. Great, thank you. Um, great questions. So I think in terms of the um, communication out to our families, um, we've been very conscientious as a board to not overwhelm, I think, um, our families um, because they'll be receiving information from employers and community supports and then the board and they're receiving from their principals um, and their classroom teachers. So we really wanted to not overwhelm at a systemic level to make sure that that core of communication was coming from their classroom team. And then as you um, articulated those rings of support um, that move out from that um, and support um, as well. So um, last week um, or earlier this week, sorry, they're kind of blending together. Um, the board put out um, a couple sheets on kind of just what is distance learning um, to help clarify that expectation again, being very different from e-learning or online learning um, and taking a look at that. The rules of DOC, um, that you've seen tonight um, and will be at board on Monday night um, and then released um, publicly um, and was shared with our principals this afternoon. That's kind of that next step of communication to say we are here and we are all part um, of collaborating and supporting whatever pieces and roles best fit for your child and your family. So if you need a menu of classroom staff, CERT and a social worker, we're here. If you need classroom staff, an EA and an intervener, we're here. Um, and so that's that next piece. Um, and then we're gonna be working with communications to start moving some of those more localized stories. So how are we supporting students in life skills programming? How are we supporting students, um, as Hannah said, um, with physical um, disability needs and starting to mobilize um, some of those narratives um, so parents can make those through lines of connect. Um, I'll take the second one just because I think it stretches over all of our services. Um, can they expect um, connection? Absolutely. Um, and just reinforcing that. Um, so our first stop is always our, our school staff, um, especially around um, the distance learning. Um, all of our staff continue to have um, access to their extensions at the board office and those are confidential and our staff are monitoring those from home. So families are welcome if they're looking for, um, as you mentioned, social work um, that's been engaged previously, they can leave them a voicemail um, and they'll pick it up. Social work and psych as well, because they do the trauma and crisis work, also have board provided cell phones. Um, and some of our families that have been active on service have those numbers um, and have been using them over the last three weeks to make connections. Um, so there's that ability as well. Um, and then just families, if they don't know who to reach, how can they reach? Um, on the board website, inclusive student services, down in the bottom right hand corner, it says contact us. Um, and if somebody hits that tab, um, that actually shoots an email right to my inbox. Um, and then I can help get that information back out to the appropriate school or member of our central team as well. So um, if they're not sure, um, they can contact school. Um, or they can contact and just that contact us um, and we'll get that information. So lots of ways of entry, but I do appreciate um, and agree with you um, that we need to get um, more of that information out, um, for example, through social media um, and just family to family connections and methods. And as the teams continue to roll out on those connections um, that will transfer as well. Um, but the opportunity to share and reinforce um, is something that we look forward to in this next wave. Great questions, thank you. Great, thank you. I know Tara has, sorry, Tara has a hard stop at 8.15 and I do know that she has a question. So um, Tara, do you wanna put that forth now? Well, uh, yeah, thanks Eva. Actually, my question is item number nine. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's talking okay. about the transitions. Um, so I don't think we're going to get to it before I have to leave, um, just based on the conversation at the moment. So um, Sarah, I can I can jump in and, and do a little just to give a highlight, because I think it fits with the current conversation, too, um, Eva, if you're good with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. in our planning, um, our next steps 
um, are definitely around IEPs. And so how do we, and we're working, um, we're getting ministry guidelines um, tomorrow in a teleconference um, around IEPs and IPRC. So those both will be moving forward and capturing kind of the accommodations and distance learning. Um, IPRCs is a critical commitment with our families. Um, and then turning our attention to transitions. So one of the things that the team is working on is a chart um, kind of of all our transitions to and from. So we have our students who are turning 21 within the 2020 calendar year. And what will now graduation look like differently for them, making sure that there's a tangible transition point for them um, and working. So our transition coordinator and shifting her role a little bit and supporting that. Um, we have a package, they're here with me. Um, uh, we know over 50 families coming to us from Durham Health on preschool services. And we'll be reaching out to them over the next week, just saying, we look forward to working with you. We haven't forgotten about you. Um, and through May, we'll be reaching out to start those. And then looking at all of those inboard transitions, I know Sarah specifically um, for you, grade eight to grade nine, um, and working with the teams and what that looks like or sounds like differently. Um, we needed our teams to be focused. Um, I think the teams mentioned it um, within theirs. Right after March break, it was around connection. So we needed our, and we needed our staff and school staff to be able to pivot to work at home themselves. So our educators and clinicians are not set up for at home working conditions. So we needed to get them pivoted to being at home and looking after their families and getting them settled. Um, we call it service in in order to service out. Uh, we need some grounding. Then last week and this week, connect and engagement, get connection and engagement, get distance learning up and running. We'll continue to do that over the next week or so. Um, and then we'll turn our attention with our school leaders um, in really doing a thorough job of planning all of those um, transitions, both micro for individual students, as well as those marker transitions such as grade eight to grade nine that we know are really, really important. Um, and some of the traditional um, supports and structures we won't be able to access. Um, so we'll be looking at that. Um, our teams have been very creative. I have lots of videos on social media with our team, school teams connecting out to students. I would imagine you'll see quite a bit of that within the um, transition planning, um, particularly at that grade eight, grade nine pivot point um, and building that familiarity with the team and the kids. Right. I, um, I think so we'll, part of... Sorry, Sorry, just some of my questions around that that I, I've I've had just in in talking with some some folks yeah. who are sort of all in that boat, um, because of some of the needs for some of our uh, our special uh, needs students, that a lot of the transition involves visiting the school, doing that physical, um, you know, face to face with the teachers and those sorts of things. Yeah. And given right now that we just have no clue if and when any of the, the state of emergency yeah. is gonna go away. What does that look like? How are we going to do that accommodation if that's something that those children need in order to have, be successfully to transition across into those new, new people, new yeah. places, new routines? How are we doing that? And is there a time frame for when the parents yeah. should be expecting that? Yeah, so I would say um, we would ask for grace within the system um, to get distance learning up and running for where the kids currently position. Um, and the teams, and then we'll be working with families because a lot of that information is gonna come in dialogue with families. Um, you're gonna know what stressors are coming forward from your kids, what their questions most are. Um, and then I think we'll see the ingenuity that we've seen in getting distance learning up and running applied to transitions. Um, our school staff um, starting right at our school um, administrators um, spiraling into the classroom staff, they're as concerned about making sure that transitions are really thoroughly supported and getting kids into the right programs um, with the right people and building those relationships. Um, so I see us mirroring what we've done with distance learning and applying it to transitions um, in terms of that commitment to relationships, getting kids what they, the scaffolds they need. Um, and again, relationships, relationships. So um, with the will of SIAC, and I can touch base with um, Eva after as well, um, I would propose that our um, department update be brief on other items, but have a heavy focus in transition planning um, when we move into May. That's great. Thank you, Tara. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. 
Um, before Siva, we oh, this is Hannah here. Did you see that I had my hand raised? Oh, so I just saw that now. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, go ahead, Hannah. Uh, yeah, I and this might be touching base a little bit on what we talked a bit about before, Andrea, but I think before we moved on from the inclusive student services reports and so forth, I think uh, Easter Seals really just wanted to provide a bit of feedback around the supports for families uh, around distance learning and the school closures. So I'm not sure if this is the place for it. Is it okay for me to give it here? Go ahead, Eva's discretion here or in the association reports. Um, Eva as chair. Either place, Hannah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, rather than it's not necessarily an association report, but a feedback that Easter Seals wants to give to all school boards, right? Um, and so I think it's the, again, going back a little bit to the access to the children's treatment centers. And then, of course, because many of those are uh, also school-based rehab services, uh, the access to the therapist. So I think one of the feedback that the families want to give uh, with students with physical disabilities for the learning around home is that uh, whether it's possible for these students to have some sort of school health support programs, like their exercises and activities, the individual uh, treatment plans that they may have, having that updated from um, that collaborative piece from the school-based rehab as well as the children's treatment centers, and then having that updated for families at this time. Now, uh, we recognize that some of the students and families' capacities will be different, but I'm wondering if there's any resources uh, being allocated to that so that families are really getting some sort of, here's a, you know therapeutic activities and exercises, and this is things you can do um, so I think that's one of the feedback that we really want to give to the school boards and having that being a bit of a priority. I, again, I'm not 100% sure now how many uh, families this falls under for within the Durham uh, District School Board, but uh, for those that this is applicable to. And, and I think we've talked a little bit um, a lot about the inclusion piece and the equity. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on the accessible features for some of the online learning and the resources. And uh, I, I, I know Durham uh, District School Board is already really good at that, but just if it hasn't been kind of highlighted, having the assistive technologists or different people uh, really look into the accessibility features with things like text-to-speech or speech-to-text and all of that. So um, I'll start on the first one and then um, tip into the second one and then um, Kyla, um, as we foresee, if there's anything I missed, please um, jump in. Um, so in terms of the therapeutic interventions, when it's specific to, um, as you said, therapeutic intervention, exercise, um, when we're into um, muscle tonality um, and things like that, um, some of the school boards across Ontario have OT, PT, um, consultants on staff um, and then go to the treatment partners locally for um, direct service. All of our OT and PT consultations do come um, through Grandview as the local provider for school-based rehab services. Um, so the occupational therapists and physiotherapists that we work with and really deeply um, and have through the transfer of partnerships uh, really value their expertise. Um, sit outside of our staff, but working congruent with our staff. So I think on that one, um, as it lands locally, that's feedback that Kyla and I will take back um, to Lorraine and the team at Grandview, just that families are looking um, for that to continue to move forward um, with the support of Easter Seals. Um, but I also think there's a role for educators in the triangulation of home, therapist, um, and classroom, both our EAs um, and our teachers as they look at that as core to many students programs. So um, not to put it over to Grandview um, and excuse us from that opportunity, um, but really anchor it within those services. Um, similarly, that Grandview wouldn't be able to speak to say our psychological services, but would work in tandem if there is dual duality of needs. We'll take it back to them, but certainly park that within our educator conversation as well. Um, in terms of the inclusion um, technology, I think that's really where it was so important that kids um, see a technology and healthcare equipment um, went home. So in our deployment of resources, we also knew that many of our students have um, are, are medically fragile. Um, and so when we set um, the deployment day where there was almost a kiss and ride process that honored physical distancing for our um, most of our students um, at our schools, 
Um, the afternoon previous to that on the, the prior day was set aside for our kids for their health equipment so that schools were able to um, double or triple the um, social distancing space and physical space between families um, and as well as the number of staff contacts that had been in that building. Part of that was a consultation with staff um, and the inclusive tech facilitators that report to Kyla and the coaches. Um, not only have they been extremely active in um, the foundations for distance learning, which you saw the team highlight, um, active in the consultation of what kids need at home. So for instance, one of our um, technology facilitators, Tracy, um, is a strong leader in switch technology. Um, and being able to get our kids their switches home um, and which apps run off them um, and those kind of functions. Um, and then the team, our inclusive tech team is actually embedded within our innovation team so that those um, equity and inclusion pieces when we consider any software or app recommendations are running right alongside parallel. Looping back to Craig's comment about how when we make the statement that equity and inclusion is a foundation to all planning, we've actually embedded our teams within each other. So instead of it looking at accommodation after, it's accommodation within consideration. Um, but I don't know, Kai, if that, um, if there was what, anything I missed in there. Uh, the only other thing I would add is just a reminder that, oh, sorry, my room's, I'm gonna turn my video off. <laughs> I'm just giving my voice. <laughs> Um, I can't get out of my chair to turn my light on. Uh, just a reminder that our Google Read and Write license is for every student in the entire district where not all boards have that capacity. We have invested in a license for every student for Google Read and Write. So as we use the forums on Google, like Google Docs and other um, tools, the Google Read and Write allows you to have that speech to text and you wouldn't need to have access separately through a SIA application package. Any student um, in the board when they log on for themselves with their account has access to Google Read and Write. So that's another layer of that technology that is available. We do have some resources that are available about supporting people and understanding how to use it. Um, I can bring back to the inclusive tech team to see if there's a way to continue to support families in knowing how to use it, recognizing that there are a number of tools that they themselves may not yet have been exposed to. And now it might be very helpful for them to be using at home. So we certainly can look at that. We have found some individual experiences where we've been able to tailor some learning and video resources to some specific needs. So if there are some unique needs or some very individualized needs that we could help with, the team is standing by and continues to develop resources. So if you let us know, we certainly can look at how we can support that. Thanks, Kyle. Okay, great, thank you guys. Okay, um, if there's no further questions uh, with respect to the student, uh, inclusive student services report, I just need to loop back quickly um, because uh, with the whole change in, in process here, I forgot that we needed to actually make a motion to approve the dates for next year. Um, so if we wanted to do that now, um, that would be helpful if somebody wanted to make a motion to approve those dates, just to stay with our, our uh, requirements. Um, I can, Hannah? this is Hannah. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Seconders? Christine, all in favor, click yes. Or no, depending on how you feel. Excellent, um, motion passed. Um, then we're going to move on to number eight, which is business arising from the minutes, um, which really was a, a list of the discussion notes, of, you know, sort of topics that people wanted to um, address for the meetings going forward. I think I heard back from, from one group. Um, if we could get those together for the next uh, session. I know it's been a crazy time and to be honest, it completely slipped my mind until I was going through the minutes. Um, if we could get that, that forward, forwarded um, so that we can put together a list and, and uh, for moving forward, I think mostly for next year, probably. Um, that would be great. Um, moving on to number nine is the staff reports. Um, 
which really had to do around um, the IPRC practices or what, how that's going to look going forward. But I don't know if Andrea has any more she wants to add to that. Uh, no, I think um, more information to come, but our commitment is to ensure that um, we uphold 181.98. Um, we will be working through a virtual format, um, as Dr. Graffy nodded to. Um, that's why we're making sure that our virtual format is compliant across all privacy standards. And that's one thing that um, we'll be sharing in the information to our school administrators, um, because a lot of the open format connect sessions don't meet the confidentiality requirements for the information that would be shared during an IPRC. Um, so we're going slow to go fast and just making sure we're thorough in those con um, consultations. Um, and deliberations, um, but our absolute commitment, we have just over 12,000 IPRCs um, to facilitate, and we want to make sure that there's meaningful family voice um, within those and that the pre-discussions are done as well. So i um, happy to bring update. I think we can tie that with the transitions piece, um, as I think we've covered that, um, but happy to do IPRCs and transitions as the focus of uh, the information in May. Okay, um, that's fantastic. So uh, then we want to move on to association reports. Does anybody have any association reports? Um, Hannah? Hannah, go ahead. Sorry there, I just had to unmute it. It took a little while here. I think Easter Seals just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we are considered an essential service, all the staff are still working. I'm not a staff, but the ball, <laughs> but all the staff are still working. And uh, well, the Easter Seals Ontario continues to accept applications. Um, and all of the for all of their programs as well that are run in partnership with the ministry and just the the fact that there may be delays just uh, based on how uh, things are, are working right now. And I think that's the only updates that I wanted to provide for Easter Seals. That's fantastic. Um, and sorry, I don't have my glasses on here because it was my screen's too close for my glasses at the moment. Um, we actually need to go to board report. <laughs> sorry about that, ladies, but uh, go ahead. Donna, you're muted. Donna, you're muted. Oh, I'm muted. It's unmuted, Nick. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, because I did have my space bar down, but it, I guess it wasn't working. Um, what our most important discussion, of course, was around uh, what's happening around uh, uh, services around the uh, COVID. Uh, uh, 19 and uh, so you've heard a lot of the um, the updated information uh, but we do have uh, two policies that we discussed around uh, the policy which came to SEAC as far as the service animals because we do have a procedure but we didn't have a policy as well as the um, uh, student dress code so they will be going to board uh, on Monday for approval um, because they were notice of motions um, we also had a, uh, a big discussion on um, uh, definitely Durham, uh, for those that may know it, that's the uh, award that we give to uh, pe uh, people that have been educated in Durham um, and have gone to be uh, doing great things. Uh, so there's an application process and uh, we had moved that from a one year uh, every awarding that award every year to three years. And so uh, the next time it comes up is uh, basically uh, 2021. So uh, we're looking at how to proceed with that. We also had a discussion on the French immersion review, um, which how we're proceeding with that, ensuring that during this time we get the, um, the consultation process going. So there's a plan for that. Um, and then uh, we also talked about uh, what's happening around uh, partnership development, especially in this times of need, um, that that was became uh, really a critical role. So we had that. 
and of course an updated uh, interim financial report, which we seem to be um, on term, but who knows what that's gonna look like next term because some items will be lower and so than expected and some items will be much higher than expected. And that's, um, uh, that's my report. Thank you, Donna. Is there anybody have, uh, oh, I see two, two hands raised. Uh, we'll go to Claudine first and then to Christine. Go ahead, Claudine. Oh, Claudine, you're muted. I turned on my video, but not my mic. I apologize. That's okay. Um, to update what's happening with Autism Ontario, they are still working. They're offering online OAP information sessions, as well as uh, we're putting out a lot of kits, craft kits, sensory-based kits, things that fit our demographics, and parents are picking them up at the Oshawa office. Um, so the support and resources DDSB Okay, the supports and resources um, document that you shared, Andrea, I'm going to request that we put a link to that on our Facebook page, because I like the way that it's concise. I too have been receiving daily resources links for different services, and it is overwhelming. I've started to ignore them. So <laughs> if there's a way for families to get these services seamlessly, I think that's best. So we're going to put it there. That's great. Thank you. And um, Carolyn and um, the other clinical leads are still on. I just named Carolyn as the as social work led that. Um, that's great for them to hear. Um, the board has um, pushed that out through social media as well. I've seen it pop up in my Facebook feed a, th a few times. Um, so you're welcome to grab it from there as well. All right. Thank you. And thank you. Everyone stay healthy. Thank you. Uh, Christine? Thank you, Claudine, and you as well. Stay healthy. Um, I think um, my comment is around the board report. Uh, I think that Donna's probably covered all of the key points. So I'll just mention that uh, Acting Director Nora Marsh wanted to stress the fact that we recognize that this is such a difficult and stressful time for our families. Uh, that parents are adjusting to working at home, um, that engagement is the key here. Uh, sometimes they're managing younger siblings at home. So it's not possible for, uh, for us to expect that uh, there are specific routines to be followed in this distance learning. Also, people are dealing with social grief. So uh, I just, just wanted to stress the fact that we are aware of that and we do recognize that and that uh, because of it, we, it is necessary for us to be extremely flexible. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Um, do, is there any more questions with respect to board report? Okay, are there any more association reports? No. Okay, um, then we can move on to correspondence. Um, it uh, looks like we had three pieces of correspondence. I know one of the pieces of correspondence um, was sort of an echo of uh, our letter with respect to Maskey. Um, and the, um, the one for um, Greater Essex County had to do with um, oh, that was that was the masky one. Um, there's one with respect to uh, the after school skills development program, um, and whether or not the rural boards could use some of the funding for transportation. And um, the other one was from our board um, with respect to uh, changes pr proposed by the uh, by the the current government with respect to to e-learning 
uh, that came from the, the uh, trustees. Did anybody have any questions on the correspondence or comments? Uh, Rowan? Uh, it wasn't so much on the correspondence, but I had had my hand up for the, uh, the oh, report. Oh, sorry, I missed you. Sorry. No, no problem at all. No problem <laughs> at all. Um, I just want to the Learning Disability Association, uh, Durham Region is having, we have a monthly um, presentation. This month it's on fostering efficacious kids, you know, with the premise being there's a lot of kids out there with a great mindset, confidence in themselves and what have you. Uh, when lack of success occurs, you know, in your academics and things of that nature uh, can lead to negative self-talk. I think we've discussed this to a point in SEAC as well, um, and it can have an effect on their abilities. So uh, it's actually the same group that we were going to uh, highlight through SEAC. Um, Saganaska, basically, um, his name is Jeff Hockett, and they're going to be doing a presentation on Zoom, uh, basically how education, educators and parents can uh, learn how to you know, communicate effectively to grow that mindset for the children. And uh, it's on Thursday, April 30th at 7.10 uh, to 8.30. And I think the document has been sent out to the group. Um, and just very quickly, just on my own, I think we all do this every day. We sit and we look at the new normal and we see what's going on. So just as an aside, I just wanted to say congratulations to what everybody has done in su I think the key in such a short period of time, um, we have little tweaks here and there. We're going to provide information. Things are going to be better. But I just want to, you know, tip my hat to everybody who's created these um, these systems that uh, we're working to basically help those in need. I think it's I truly think it's amazing. And I know it's just going, you know, even if situations start to get worse, I know we're continuing to get better. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Rowan. Um, did anybody else have anything to add? Um, with respect to the correspondence, did anybody uh, have any questions, concerns, comments with respect to the correspondence that we received? No? Okay, um, moving on then to item number 12, community concerns. Uh, we've typically had this as questions and comments, but we thought we'd rename it so that it would, it would be a little clearer on uh, what that section really uh, could be used for. Um, and uh, so if, if anybody has any concerns that they're hearing within their community that they'd like to raise right now, um, that, would, that would be fantastic. Uh, I have a question, uh, Eva, or I yeah. guess comment. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, are we, uh, I mean, things are, are changing so fast that, uh, you know, what we're doing today is looks very different from what we're doing tomorrow or even next week. Um, is there something in place to capture some of the, whether it's feedback from families, um, teachers and so on of what's working, uh, at this time and what's maybe not working so well so that at the end of all this, because I mean, this is kind of like a, a working experiment that we didn't expect to be conducting um, that we can maybe gather some of this information because if going forward there's going to be whether it's distance learning e-learning or whatever I think some of the lessons we're learning now will probably save us some pain down the road once we're back to some kind of normal and deciding to roll out some of these things so um, I, you know is there some kind of mechanism for doing that I mean maybe Andrea could speak to that so Eva, through you, if it's okay. Um, yeah. Carolyn, thank you for raising that because I think um, as much as we need to tweak and recalibrate, as you said, um, this experiment, and I would say uh, we're all living it and working in it um, as we adjust with our own families as well, um, that there's lots of great news and even in board um, and across our partners, we've said that there's some really great learning and service that we'll want to hold on to. Um, and adapt in, so it won't be a return to previous, it'll be a return to new normal, bringing some of that great learning forward. Um, as we were getting distance learning up and running and the deployment of technology, um, we use thought exchange um, and the ability for parents to actually physically phone in um, to the team as well with feedback around their needs. Um, and that was really foundational to helping shape um, what's being created. And Rowan, thank you for your kind comments as well um, and the feedback tonight. Um, and so I would say that we'll probably um, re-engage that as a structure. 
um, looking at what families um, suggest as tweaks, um, but also gathering those good news stories of what's working for them, um, because that's really important. And then our educator voice and our administrator voice is really essential in that as well. Um, and our educators were surveyed in the um, as distance learning supports, and that's where Spark um, grew um, and was born out of specific to distance learning. Um, so again, really important voices because we look at our team serves. We've got a really unique um, privilege. We direct serve students and families, but we also direct serve those who are supporting the kids in our schools. Um, and so that would be data that we would really look for, but I think you'll see it come out from the senior team um, as we move through this. Um, I know the Premier has announced the extension of emergency order and said that schools will not be reopening on May 4th. Um, we do not have a new date yet. Um, and so I think once we have that, that will time some of our sequence of looking for that additional feedback um, as we move into, I think we're going in now into phase three um, with that further extension. So um, great idea, Carolyn, thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I have just one thing to add to that. I, I, I don't know if other schools have done this or not. I know Pickering High, we received an email from our um, academic resource department um, that did have a link reaching out to parents for one um, and letting them know that they're available but also a, a, a link to a google document that had a list of questions that parents had had so far um, i was going to go into it but unfortunately i have to sign into google on my phone to do that right now and that takes too much time <laughs> um, so um, but those are some things i know some schools are doing um, with respect to that Anybody else have any community concerns that have been brought to their attention? Oh, okay. Um, now I, I'm, I'll just bring this forward and Kathy Keaty's um, regret. She did mention, I think that, uh, I don't know if it's, it's just her, her, her child or there's other kids with hearing impairment, but I think there's there may be a little bit of issues that maybe we need to reach out to some of the schools on, on with respect to their kids who are, are um, deaf and hard of hearing uh, to ensure that there's captioned, if they're sending out videos that they're captioned or they're using a platform that has captioning uh, for students if they're doing a live feed like a Zoom, a Zoom classroom type thing um, so that the kids are able to participate in those. I think there's been some issues around that um technology is great and it can be tricky for some as well so um i'm not sure if there's a plan around that but yeah we'll continue to follow up i think um part of kathy's message was around um, the accommodation within our SEAC meeting itself as well um and so with the help of our tech crew i'm not on screen this evening but definitely behind the scenes and alongside um, our conversation this evening um as SEAC has been captured um, we are connecting in one format, um, but the conversation has um, been captured and streamed through YouTube with the closed captioning on um, for our community um, that's tuning in tonight. Um, we continue to look at our means of digital connect for meetings um, and the accommodation is definitely part of that conversation. Um, Lisa has shared a few times too that uh, Zoom screen is this wide, but um, the team meets is wider. So even from an interpretation perspective, our interpreters have a wider physical range to support in certain modalities. So lots of layered, um, really great conversations um, that we didn't have before um, that are coming into the mix. So we appreciate Kathy's um, comments and embed those in our planning further. That's great. Uh, Christine? Yeah, I just had a question around Zoom, uh, Andrea. Um, I know that uh, we're using the program for our board meetings um, and, um, and of course our SIAC meetings and so on, but are the teachers using Zoom or is it Google Classroom? Um, professional discretion is really key and our team's providing some guidance. Um, I believe that acting director Marsh will be providing some updates to the board of trustees on that shortly. Thank you. Okay, Donna. Uh, just a, a couple of, of comments in that um, I, I do know in talking to some parents that teachers are using a variety of, of platforms. 
Um, a lot of times it depends on what they've been comfortable with. Um, so it could have been Zoom, it could have been Google Classrooms, it could have been D2L, it could be a couple of things. Um, and we didn't want to um, tell a teacher that they had to use a specific uh, platform, especially in this time, because I give kudos to those teachers because um, as Andrea had mentioned at the, at the very beginning that uh, we had a, a PD day uh, scheduled on the Friday and basically Thursday, you know, late Thursday, it basically said, no, you're not allowed to go back in the schools. And that included teachers. So they had left resources behind and so forth because they expected to be in the schools basically for the next day. Um, and so the first thing was getting staff prepared to do this. And, um, and some of uh, some staff had to learn technology fairly fast because they weren't used to using some of the technology. So they had different levels of experiences, but they've, they've done a phenomenal job of, of, of trying to do that. And then the next thing was, was students and staff. I just also wanted to, to mention to Carolyn that um, we uh, at OTSPA, uh, we have had, uh, I had a policy meeting uh, just and a programs meeting, a joint policy and programs meeting. Um, and um, we are planning to collect uh, some of the feedback as far as what's happening during this time, um, as far as feedback to the ministry, as, as far as, you know, this is real life learning experiences um, and some of the challenges from the various boards because across the province, um, there is varying needs and, and um, some people seem to think that, you know, down south internet access is just peachy when it's just north of highway 7 and you can't get high you can't get internet access or it's very degraded and it's it's hard to have access there so um just consider that and then some of the far north boards where they really don't have any access so um we're all providing that and gathering that information to provide feedback uh, to to the minister Thanks, Donna. That's great. I know I have some friends that are living in rural areas that, you know, have uh, concerns about uh, internet access and speed and, and all of that. So uh, it'll be good to see what that feedback looks like. Does, it, does anybody else have any comments or uh, concerns they want to raise now? Um, I, I think I, there's only one more suggestion. I think it's been a great rollout. I, I've actually been pretty impressed overall with how how well things came out that first week. Um, you know, the, the only thing I would say with high school students, um, you know, maybe encouraging because for some kids, they need uh, a visual lesson and something, a visual and audio lesson. Um, and I know that most of what I've seen has come through sort of in a, in a read format. Uh, only. Um, and I think in certain subjects, in particular science or math, a link to a video uh, explanation, if not a recorded one by the teacher, because I know some are not comfortable in that, and I, I could understand that, but uh, to, to provide that lesson, uh, um, audio, you know, through a visual and audio format as well, uh, would be helpful to, I think, a number of our students. Yeah, okay. So, um, if there's nothing else, we can move on to item number 13, celebrations and successes. Anybody have any celebrations and successes they'd like to bring forward? I, I would just like to say that uh, I think we could all celebrate in, uh, the success of, of how well things have rolled out so far. Um, obviously, there's always um, there's always improvements that that you know tweaks that can be made along the way as we we encounter those you know where those barriers may be arising. Uh, but I think overall, um, people have done a great job. Uh, Donna, uh, you stated it that you said it very well. It's kudos to staff and I mean all staff what they've been doing. Um, you know, tech support, our SOs, our principals, our teachers, our EAs, everybody that has been out, they've just been phenomenal. Yeah. 
Um, anybody else have anything to add? Um, if not, um, our next SEAC meeting is Thursday, May 21st. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we may be very well doing it virtually again <laughs> because we know we're not going back May 4th. So realistically, um, but you know we'll know that 100%. You know as as we get up to that date. Um, and if there's nothing more to add, uh, then we can move to. Somebody can make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Anybody like to uh, Christine? Second. I'll Rowan. Second. Sure. All all in favor? Click yes. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you uh, taking the time. Bye, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.